I would like to introduce uh, our next speaker. Faith Spotted Eagle is a grandmother who lives on the Ihangtuan Dakota Territory, Yankton Sioux, in southeastern South Dakota. She has a master's degree in counseling, has been a school principal, manager of human services programs, and a PTSD therapist for the Veterans Administration. She is a fluent speaker of the Dakota language and a member of the Hongtuan, although she descends from Shichanju, Hungpati, and Hungpapa, and Medewakantuan. She is a founding grandmother of the Brave Heart Society, supervised by a group of community grandmothers called the Kunchi Circle, which is dedicated to environmental justice and restoring endangered and lost cultural practices to heal the wounds endured by the Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota peoples. Faith has been involved in grassroots work for decades, and the Brave Heart Society has been instrumental in many areas, battling for environmental justice within Native communities, healing survivors of sexual violence, and utilizing traditional spiritual ceremonies of the Ocheti Shakoin to fight historical trauma. As the chair of the Ihangtuan Treaty Committee and Brave Heart Society grandmother, she helped bring forth the international treaty to protect the sacred against the KXL pipeline and the tar sands. She has been a delegate of the Treaty Committee NGO at the United Nations. Faith has said, our society has the basic principles of a Dakota society that exists to bring balance where unbalance has occurred, to resolve conflict, preserve culture and language, and assure a place for our gr grandchildren in the future. We have a 50-year strategic plan in order to accomplish that. In order to be on our governing board, one has to be a grandmother, as we value wisdom and experience. And without further ado, I want to introduce to you Faith Spotted Eagle. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> okay, I have a formidable task before me. Uh, this is always death hour for presenters. I'm competing with this wonderful indigenous food, so I'll give it a shot. Uh, first of all, I uh, in my tribal language, I uh, extend my hand to you, and I'm really very honored to be in your midst because I think you're at working at the core of one of the basic principles of what we have to do in order to survive, to go forward as, as nations all across Turtle Island. What the, they asked, Mindy asked me what the title of my speech would be, and I'm gonna <clears throat> rip through this pretty fast because I only have 20 or 25 minutes, and me being a kushi, I could talk for hours. So this is gonna be a challenge. But what I'm talking about is personality is created by specific places that possess power. I would like to say that I thought that up, but you heard the young Pawnee woman this morning talk about indigenous knowledge. And so that was something that we possessed in every single camp circle. The problem is that the camp circle got broken. The camp circle was invaded and torn apart. The government uh, deliberately targeted the native family that had all of this indigenous knowledge. So now you all are called forward in your lifetimes to help put this back together. But obviously, if you're not indigenous, then you have to be able to reach out and ask for the necessary help to create this beautiful, strong life that we had even a short hundred years ago. So what I want to talk about is four or five things really swiftly. I want to talk about indigenous science. The things that we talked about, the young Pawnee woman this morning, we had very wise philosophers, psychologists, scientists that were so amazing that in our community, it wasn't such a big thing to be called a medicine woman. It was like every single woman knew what was in the pharmacy be behind the teepee, surrounding the teepee, before the camp was set up. That knowledge was so finite that it gives excitement to me to see all the young people stepping up. And once again, we're gonna be able to create, to recognize those pharmacies. So I wanna give hands up to the indigenous science that we have, because a lot of times uh, I heard the lady talk about um, the science that you have to, my challenge is practice-based um, science. 
And I come from a traditional women's society called Braveheart Society. And believe it or not, we have been in existence for 22 years. We gave birth to a revival of a society that lived in the, lives in the borderlands. And the things that we're going to talk about today, we're trying to create those doors into the camp circle to be able to bring it home so indeed we can uh, embrace the work that you're talking about at this conference. The second thing that I want to talk about is because that camp circle was targeted, there's a healing imbalance, and Tiffany talked about that in my work. When I first started out as a counselor, I couldn't put my finger on what was happening. I worked in schools, and I was on this journey of searching. What was it I was supposed to do? I went to work in mental health agencies. I went to work in a psychiatric unit. What I didn't realize is that what we're working with is a deep spiritual wound that has been created by centuries of trauma, oppression, and violence. And once I realized that I had it, uh, my father had it, my grandparents had it, all of a sudden the path became clear for me. And so I want to challenge you in saying that you cannot take people where you haven't been. If you haven't looked at your own healing, if you haven't looked at your own trauma and the violence that you grew up with, and we can't argue that we have not grown up in violence because we live in, most, in one of the most violent countries in the world. It's very subtle. I just came from Standing Rock, and I know many of you have been at Standing Rock. I talked to you. But what we're experiencing at Standing Rock is something called biopolitics. And what that means is that a government has policies where we have absolutely no control over our body. We can be attacked by dogs, and it's dismissed. We can die at high rates of illness, and so what? We don't get adequate funding. We only get money for limb and death. That is biopolitics because we are dispensable. So when we embrace that, we have to, we don't embrace it, we reject it and we say, we have to reach for those old new ways of bringing back that camp circle. And the way that I have uh, been privileged to work with is looking at what trauma does to each one of us. Up here, there's a PowerPoint that says historical trauma in Indian country. When I realized I worked with 30 kids for two years that were so broken in the Northwest, and not all of them were native. They were so resilient. I worked with twins that developed their own language because they were locked in a closet. There was nothing wrong with them. It was their parents that were broken by some type of trauma, and they continued to pass that on. We all know that story. But the reason I say that is when I worked with those 30 kids, I thought, you know what? I know this. This is at home. This is what happens at home on the reservation where all this historical trauma happens over and over again. When we say it, we really have to take an extra step forward to understand it because every one of you has an element of it. Native America is called to acknowledge that this Holocaust did happen in our country and move through those stages that I'm going to talk about in a little bit and come to acceptance as this horrible, terrible thing happened to me, but I'm no longer going to be defined by that trauma that trapped me for a lot of years. Non-Native America is challenged to come out of that trauma response of denial because that's, that's the historical trauma that this country faces, continual denial. We get attacked by dogs and they say, oh, you know, those were security dogs. That's denial. So I'm going to ask the person with the PowerPoint power back there to go on to the next slide. Where are you? Okay, can you go to the next slide? One of the things um, that I have come to realize, and the reason I'm doing this is because the work that you're doing, just like when I was young and I was searching and I couldn't put my finger on it, a lot of your wonderful approaches that you're doing in the health field you're probably thinking, why isn't this working? Why, why couldn't this be better? Because at the core of it is some real deep spiritual wounds that once you recognize them in yourself and other people, things are going to start to click. You're going to have that awareness that, okay, I understand this. I really know this. The, and the way I begin to embrace it is when I came home, I lived in the Northwest for 20 years. One of the things that I noticed that when I came home, my people were really mean. I mean, I just, I think the teenagers back then used to call it mean mugging. You, you go home and you're all happy and you're thinking the world's going to celebrate. I came home. They're not celebrating. They're thinking, what are you doing here? 
and you go to Walmart, you see another Native person, you're all happy to see them, and they look the other way, right? And you go down the other aisle, and you think, oh, no, there they are again. <laughs> we're in the process of avoiding each other because in our historical trauma, we were told not to like each other. You go to the post office of any community, you walk up to the post office, people look down and they look away and they, we pretend not to see each other. The, the trauma is that deep that we reject each other. The only kind of relationship that we know how to make is with rage and violence. You can bet if I walked up to that post office, I remember in Rosebud, I'm part Sichangu, I walked up to the post office and I saw this individual and I said, good morning, and they kind of looked at me and said, hi, look the other way. You can bet they would make relationship with me if I went like this, right? <laughs> We'd have a real quick relationship of the F word. All of a sudden, it would, they'd be stepping up and saying, who are you? You know, who's your family? So what it comes down to, when I realized that we only know those kinds of relationships, not only in Indian country, but also in America. We, we are a country of rage. And so I came one morning, I woke up in that sleep time before you wake up and get out of bed. And I thought, what am I going to call this thing that is afflicting my people? Because we are so cruel to each other, so mean to each other. And it happens in the African-American community. You all know that if you went to college, you probably read Paolo Freire, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. How many of you read that? Real tough book to read. It's even tougher if you relate it to yourself, because that's why you're supposed to read it. The other one, The Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon. He talks about the experience of the Algerian people. All of this is designed for us to reflect it back to ourselves, not to read it and think about someone else. When I talk about this, I want you to think about yourself. So I thought, what am I going to call this thing? In that sleep time, I thought, I'm going to call this red rage because that's what we have. It's way beyond anger. Anger is a natural human emotion. In a little bit, I'll show you that trauma response. And you know how when um, clinics or providers send you to anger management? That is totally inappropriate. Because I am not angry. I am really pissed off. And it's like, F you. <laughs> it doesn't even have anything to do with anger. And when you talk to Native people about that, they all go, yeah, yeah, that's where it is. F that. <laughs> So we're talking about a different level of feeling, a very emotional experience. One of my relatives, um, and some of you are probably related to her, Ella Deloria, great, great writer that saved much of our history. She said, any time that you have a peak, high, amazing emotional experience, you're going to integrate that for the rest of your life. Hence, ceremonies, very emotional. But when the ceremonies went away, we had very... Powerful, strong, lasting trauma that integrated it in the place of the ceremonies. So we're stuck with it. So that's why we have to shift it. We have to, when we begin to do our shaking ceremonies, if some of the things that I t say today cause your spirit to shake a little bit, that means that there's something that behooves you to look at yourself and hold up that mirror. And you all know that because you, most of you probably have children. You know the state you are in by the way the children, your own children perceive you, right? Because they're dead honest. I remember I was at a powwow one time, and this was before I went into codependency treatment, and I really began to look at my own PTSD. I was at a powwow, and my little girl came up to me, and she was all sweaty. She's all grown up now, but she was all sweaty, and she said, you know, I don't want to be a sh uh, shawl dancer. You're a traditional dancer. I'm going to be like you. She said, you don't even have to move. You just barely go like this. <laughs> she said, I want to do that. And I said, you know what, my girl? You can't do that until you're calm, you're serene, you know, you know who you are. And she looked at me and she said, oh, do you think you should be a traditional dancer? <laughs> so our kids know exactly where we are in red rage. And so that's a tough one because they are going to challenge you. And my kids are my teachers. I'm renegotiating my relationship with them on into their 30s and 40s because we had a tough road, and a lot of it was red rage. So if you look up there, it's the emotional overreaction that Native people have perpetuated by the impact of generations of trauma, violence, and oppression. It's way beyond anger. It creates rageful individuals, nations, and communities. 
and it makes it difficult for us to find common ground. When it's unrecognized or untreated, it goes into disorders. So if I'm a victim of molestation, rape, all the other things that happen, I have this overriding fear. And the last thing I'm probably going to be listening to you is you talking to me about nutrition, right? <laughs> That's kind of not on my mind right now. <laughs> if all this other stuff is going on. And I want to share this um, experience that I had with this girl. I asked her, I said, what does it feel like to have PTSD? She said, okay, I want you to remember the most terrible day that you had in your life where the world was falling apart, nobody would talk to you, you felt ugly, you felt like you were going to die. And she said, do you have it? Do you have that feeling? I said, I got it. And she said, and get this, she said, I feel like that every day. So if there's, and a lot of our youth this way, they're just surviving. So our job is to get them to, to recognize that, to work with them. There's going to be three, I'm going to go to the trauma response now. I'm going to run out of time, but... The two things that are walking through our community that are going to hinder your work, unless you recognize it, is the rage and the fear, which is the companion to rage. Fear-based thinking. So I want you to think about that as I go forward. If you could pull up the trauma response. This is what it looks like to heal. This is what it looks like to realize that you have been oppressed. This is what it looks like on what you have been doing all of your life, whether you realize it or not. This is a trauma response. On the left there, you have the stressor. That can be any number of things. It could be molestation. It could be job trauma. Maybe you got fired. Maybe you lost a child. You can guarantee every one of us in this room are going to go through a rite of passage, and you're going to lose your parents if you haven't lost them already. Nobody's getting out of here alive. But we have to know that that's going to be a stressor. When that stress happens, we go to that second stage of immobilization where we freeze. Now, most of you probably that are clinicians, you know this, but the reason I show it to you is because within this continuum in our old camp circle, and we're bringing that back now, we have woven ceremonies of healing. They're intertwined in there, and we desperately need to bring them home if they're not already there. That second stage of immobilization when you freeze, it doesn't just happen when that incident took place, when that loss took place or that grief. There are some people in this room probably that are still in immobilization. When they had a loss, they never moved beyond that. I worked with a young man in Albuquerque one time, and he had a real flat, monotone voice. And he came up to me after I did my workshop, and he said, you know, Faith, I think I have what you talked about. And I said, you do? I said, what happened? What was the stressor? He said, my mom died. And I said, how long ago did your mom die? 20 years ago. And I looked at him and I said, young man, you need to let your mom go. Your mom's got things to do in the spirit world. You need to let her go. And he just broke down and he started to cry. And of course, he was embarrassed. And I said, don't you dare stop crying. You need to let her go. And this is the only way you're going to do it. So he was immobilized. And so some of us, if we get lonesome for our spirit, we feel, you know how when you drive in a car and you go from point A to point B and you don't remember how you got there? That's what it feels like to not stand in full spirit. So in this room, there are people probably who are not standing in full spirit because we have not been able to negotiate this, heal from these bases up here, and finally end up accepting that these hard, terrible things happen to good people. That third level, denial, we all, that's self-explanatory. That might be like when mom is gone, the matriarch, who's the new matriarch? Great conflict. Who's going to have Christmas dinner now? Or who's going to have Thanksgiving? And people are going to debate. They'll say, uh -uh, mom asked me to do it. Conflict. So sometimes we're not able to accept that, yes, this occurred, and now we have to go on. The next stage is where red rage lives, anxiety and anger. When a loss occurs and I hurt, maybe my parent has gone down, maybe my, my pet you know, we can't minimize the loss of an animal. Then I'm anxious. I'm angry. I'm pissed off that creator did this to me. But if I can move on, then I might be okay for anger management. But if I don't and I medicate, then the rage begins to build and it gets higher and higher and higher. 
if the work isn't done and we stay on this left side of the trauma response, that's where medicating comes in. The gambling, the drinking, the smoking, whatever that addiction. And that addiction is a shield because I don't want to look at any of this. And the last thing, again, is I don't want to do a nutrition education program because I've got these pressing things in my life where I can't think and I can't feel and I do not feel safe. So you have to, so when you get to that point and you're talking to somebody on some spot on this trauma response, the basic thing that they need is a sense of safety. So if you're all shuffling your papers and looking at your watch and saying, oh, you know, I got another meeting, but I do want you to, you know, take this menu and do all of that. They're not going to feel very safe. It's like, they're not even interested in me. I'll just get through this. And maybe they'll buy me some food. <laughs> so the next stage, anyway, remember, red rage is in that impact, and it's unfortunately alive and well in many of our communities that have been oppressed, including non-Native America. We have road rage. We have the shootings. That's a prime example. The next stage, if I'm able to move out of rage, I get into self-doubt. And I think, okay, my parent has died. I think I might be able to make it. I remember I was in a period of anger for about four years because when my father died, he didn't even come to me in a dream. And I thought, where are you? And finally, four years later, I dreamt about him. And I thought, that was not about him. That was about me because I wasn't accepting it. When I finally accepted it, then he came. So that was that self-doubt where you, you assess and you say, am I ready to begin worrying about my body? Because before that, if I'm consumed and I'm on the left side over here, I don't care about my body, my mind. The next step, down below, the big black hole. That's a tough place to go, but you cannot stop going there because it's kind of like an idling period where your mind, spirit, spirit and body is trying to put itself back together. It's called depression, the big black hole. You don't feel like doing anything. You've had four cups of coffee. You get to work, and you feel so tired. And then you get home, and the kids are asking for things, and you're so tired. That's probably a danger signal where somebody else needs to help. We, we can see that with, each other, with our colleagues sometimes. The next step is a real danger time for young people. Between depression and testing, testing when is when an individual, we hope and pray, will begin to move out of depression, and they're going to start trying new things after the loss and the grief. Maybe they'll get a Christmas tree after mom has been gone for a while. Maybe they'll go to the mall. Maybe they'll do something. After the suicide of a friend, that's a big one. I've worked with youth. They said, I don't feel like going to the mall anymore after my friend left. But they're testing, and pretty soon their, their energy, the molecules, the physics starts to happen in their body. However, this is a danger point for youth because sometimes we think they're better, but they're really not. They're just pacifying everybody else, and they've already decided what they're going to do. The last stage is accepting that, yeah, something really horrible happened and is continuing to happen. Four days ago, I was very honored to testify before the Natural Resources Committee in the House in Washington, D.C. They had five panelists come because of the Standing Rock issue, and I was honored to be the elder that came, uh, the spiritual person to come talk about it. One of the Congress people asked me, she said, so lots of your youth are committing suicide. What is the answer? I just kind of had to hang on to my red rage. <laughs> I thought, I'm in Congress. I can't be acting up here. <laughs> and so I said, as, as nicely as I could, I said, the traumatization has not stopped. The oppression has not stopped. And these kids know it because, like my little girl telling me, she is mirroring my feelings, and she's mirroring all of the adults around her. And it is pretty sad. There are some hard things, some untruths that are happening. Uh, you probably have read that book, Lies That My Teacher Told Me. They grow, grow up in systems like that, and, why, and then we wonder why they commit suicide. It's a schizophrenic world where the truths are not told. So 
as I go through this and share this with you, I want to point out three things that are helpful with people of trauma. Your job in your work is to create, as I said before, a sense of safety. That when they come into your office, you may not get anything done that first meeting or that second meeting or even the third meeting, but you make them feel safe. You make your self feel safe. You do some reconciling about your own timing. Because you know what? I have a firm belief that everybody has a divine plan. There's a reason between you and that person coming together. You have that intersect and make the best of it. The second thing that will help people of trauma is the circle of support that they have, that we have. With youth, it's usually their teacher or their provider. And it's not always their parents. The majority of the time, the youth will say it's not their parents. So we have to create a circle of support that will allow us for a minute for the spirit to re-enter our body. The third thing with people of trauma and doing effective work is the age that the original trauma occurred. If it happened at two years old, they were molested for a long period of time, they were absent and they will have large blank periods in their life where they will not remember things that everybody else remembers. But they do have a body memory. So the way the body memory works is fear of the ordinary. I'm afraid of things that I don't know, that are unpredictable and are unknown. So I get anxiety. I can't breathe. This is too much. I can't do this. And it becomes overwhelming. So again, being able to assess body memory, even if they do not remember the incident, I'm a survivor myself. When I began to do my healing, all of a sudden things popped up that I had no clue had happened. But it was to protect my body. I'm going to close. I have, how many minutes do I have? Two minutes? Whoa. Um, <laughs> I'm going to close with a couple of fast stories. I had a strange incident happen to me when I worked with the VA. Well, I still work with the VA. I was in the Black Hills working with uh, uh, Black Hills VA. And I know this for a fact, a spiritual truth, that when you are not present in full standing with your spirit, that spirit is not in your body because of these things that have happened. So I'm sitting there, and we're in the lower level, and there's no kids there. It's all adults, veterans. We're doing our work. We're taking a break at lunch like you are. And all of a sudden, I saw this little person pop up. And I looked over, and it looked like it was a 12-year-old girl. She had real frizzy hair. She had the Coke bottle glasses on. She had a real skinny neck. She was a kid. She looked up, and she kind of scanned the room. And then she looked at me, and she looked away, and she was gone. And I thought, where did that little girl come from? I thought we didn't have kids here. And I looked over, and there was a young woman sitting there, and she had curly hair. You know, the hair was kind of under control. She had glasses on. And I thought, that was her. And so I, you know how sometimes you're in that surreal moment where you just know? And so I got up and I, she walked out of the room and I walked up to her and we walked down the road for a little bit and I said, can I visit with you? And she said, sure. And I said, you know what? I saw your little girl spirit. And she looked at me and she said, ah, oh, I keep her pretty well hidden. Where'd you see her? And I said, I saw her standing beside you. And she kind of looked back and you could see that she went somewhere. And she said, how old was she? And I said, she probably was about 12 years old. And all of a sudden, you can tell she just went somewhere. And she said, oh, that's when it happened. And she kind of put her head down. And I said, it's OK. It's OK. Let's go for a walk. And so I asked her, I said, what happened? And she said that was when her dad started to molest her. So her spirit left. And since, and that actually, I was able to witness that, and I, that has happened to me several times. So I know that to be a fact. I know that to be a truth. So re reflect upon yourself, because every one of you have some kind of loss. But I guarantee you, if you work at it better for yourself, you're going to take people to those places that you now have been. If you're in denial and saying, well, I didn't have too much, you know, original trauma, then you're probably in a place of denial. The other thing is that I used to think that Native people have the monopoly on trauma. There is no way. When I started working in the VA, there is so much hurt and trauma in this country. We really are in trouble, and we all need to work on this. 
We really all need to, we know what's happening with all the shootings. This is what's happening. This anger, this rage. But when it comes to Native people, we have had so much trauma. We like to have fun with it. I mean, it's like we love trauma stories. It's like, oh, yeah, the world's falling apart again. We can handle this. And I want to close with a story that was given to me by a young, beautiful girl in St. Stephen's, Wyoming. She said, you know, you're always going around the country talking about trauma. She said, I'm going to give you a trauma joke. And I said, okay. She said, uh, and it was about this time. And she said, um, this woman had this little boy. And it was around Halloween time. And he said, Mom, I know what I want to be for Halloween. And she said, what? And he said, I want to be a pilot. And he kind of had a hard time with his speech. They were sending him to a speech development person. And he said, I want to be a pilot. And she said, pirate. And he said, no, pilot. She said, OK, you can be a pilot. And so she got him all ready. And he went up. This was in a housing area in Wyoming. And he goes up and he knocks on the door. He's all dressed up, proud of himself being a pilot. And the door, this is about red rage. This mom just throws the door open and she says, what do you want? Remember the, the red rage? And he kind of like quivers and he says, trick or treat. And she said, and what are you? And he said, I'm a pilot. Can't you see? And she said, well, where's your buccaneers? And he looks at her and he says, if you would open your bucking eyes, you would see on top of my that's from St. Stephen's, Wyoming. Thank you. <laughs>